Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming to this talk, uh, which is named Uncovering SIP Vulnerabilities. Uh, and it's basically uh, the process I follow trying to understand how the protocol works and trying to use that information for, from a security perspective. So I'm Martin Gacho uh, from the consulting team of Core Security. So let's start by reviewing the agenda for the talk. First, I will give a quick introduction on the topic and what SIP is. Then uh, I will start showing some of the previous work that has been done on the protocol uh, and showing the motivation for my research. And then I will show some of the main components of the subnet weaver architecture for those who are not familiar with. And Moving on to the main section of this talk, uh, which is uh, dissecting and trying to understand how the, the protocol works, ending up with some results showing some of the tools I develop, and discussing some defenses and countermeasures that can be applied. So let's start. Uh, SAP is a software company based in Germany. It's the least leader business software provider. And most of the large enterprises runs the most critical process on subsystems. So it has become a hot topic in security in, in recent years. And I think that some components are still not well covered. Um, one of the things is that some of these protocols are proprietary and documentation is not public. So this is one of the things that makes it difficult to, to have more knowledge about subsecurity. So this talk is basically about uh, the DIAC protocol. DIAC means uh, Dynamic Information and Action Gateway. And it's a network protocol used for communications between the sub GUI, the desktop client application, and the application servers, the subnet weaver application servers. So, this protocol is present in every Subnet Weaver installation uh, that is based on ABAP. Uh, and one of the main characteristics is that the protocol is not encrypted and it's only compressed by default. So encryption is optional and can be uh, implemented using a third party product or a free product that were released by SAP uh, last year. Uh, and the component is called SNNC for secure network connections. So the protocol runs on TCP ports 22,000 and 22.99. And there were a lot of work uh, in the recent years uh, around the protocol. Uh, back in 2009, there were some proprietary tools to trying to dissect the traffic of the protocol and getting uh, clear text credentials, but uh, the tools were not public, so there's no, no, no much. Uh, in 2009, uh, Securon published a paper in which uh, he introduced a method to, for sniffing the clear text credentials, uh, which they called a reflection method. Uh, which is basically to get a network trace of a login and starting a fake uh, server and using the trace of that, se that session and connecting with uh, another uh, GUI to, to that fake server and looking to process memory to, to get the point text uh, password. So it's not a very useful attack. It works, but uh, it can be used in a practical way. So in 2010, uh, Denis Yurichev published in his blog an article when, where he uh, found that the compression algorithm based, being used uh, in the protocol is the same that the compression algorithm using in Max uh, DB open source product. So MaxDB is an open source uh, database. Uh, so the implementation of the algorithm, the compression algorithm, 
uh, is available. And he writes a small tool to decompress the traffic. And it helps a lot uh, trying to understand how the protocol works. Uh, more recently, in 2011, there was a lot of work uh, on the protocol. The main one and the most interesting is a proxy-like tool that was released by Sempost. And it's a hub application that you can uh, run to, to, to make a proxy, to proxy communications between a GUI and the application server. So additionally, uh, the compression plugin for Warshack was also released. And some sniffing capabilities were added to, to Cain and Abel to uh, uh, get also credentials. So as can be seen, most of the previous work was based on uh, compression and the compression of the traffic and the protocol inner workings and details about the packet, de packet formats remains still unknown. And there's no practical tool to perform a penetration test against this protocol or to make an assessment. So this was mainly the motivation for my, for my research. And also the protocol is relevant because it's present in every NetWeaver installation. And we often see uh, customers that are not using encryption. So this makes also an interesting point. And additionally, uh, out of the around of 2,200 security fixes published by SAP, uh, only two affect the, the protocol. So this also makes uh, an interesting point to, to, to make some assessment and trying to, to attack the protocol. So let's move on to the main components of the SAP NetWeaver architecture. Uh, the NetWeaver architecture is the infrastructure layer where all SAP's applications run. And it's based on a three-tier layer. So in the presentation layer, there is the SAP GUI uh, client, which is a FAT client, a, a desktop ac application, and a browser in case you are accessing SAP's web applications. Uh, the database layer is independent, so you can use any commercial database product. And in the business layer, there are two main different versions of NetWeaver, uh, one based on Java and the other one based on ABAP. Uh, and we will be talking on, on, on ABAP uh, in a few slides. So this talk is mostly uh, focused on the ABAP engine part and the SAPGI client, uh, which, is, which are the components that uses the protocol for, for the communications. So some concepts and components that I, I want to mention because are relevant. The first one is the ABAP. Uh, ABAP is SAP's programming language. All standard programs, almost all standard programs of, of any SAP application are written in, in this language. And you can also customize and create your own programs. So this component plays a key part on, on, on every sub system. Uh, another interesting concept is the dispatcher and the word processes. Dispatcher is the net service that listens to the network for requests coming uh, from the GUI application, from the, the GUI client, and distributes all those requests to a pool of different word processes. Each word process handles different tasks and runs different, different tasks. And there are five different uh, word processes. Uh, we will be mostly focusing on dialogue word processes, which are the operating system process that parses all the requests coming from the dialogue protocol. And the last concept that I want to mention is the dialogue processing which is a, the programming method which is used for all the ABAP programs and is based on two different concepts. The screens, that are all the screens that you see in the SAPGI client, 
uh, with all the controls and input boxes, etc. And the dialogue steps, which are all the logic behind one screen and another. So this is important for, for the protocol because all the screens uh, travels from, uh, from the network, from the GUI to the server, and from the server to the, to the GUI uh, in the DIAC protocol, using the, the, the DIAC protocol. So SAP uses different network protocols at different components. Some of them are standard, like HTTP, SSL, so, et cetera, and others are proprietary protocols. Uh, the first on the more, on one of the, the the first protocols that came up is the network interface protocol. Uh, it's a protocol used to do some error handling and do some checks on on all uh, network connections. And different proprietary protocols runs above this one. So you have, for example, the RFC protocol, which is remote function call and it's used to, to call a remote module in, in another system. Uh, the router protocol, which is used by subrouter, that is uh, an application level gateway that is used to control access between different network segments to, to subsystems. Um, then you have the DIAC protocol, which is the subject of this talk. So, Having said that, and uh, setting some context about SAP, uh, let's start by reviewing the process I followed trying to understand how the protocol works. So my approach was mostly a black box approach. Uh, one of my goals was not to reverse engineer the binaries. The binaries are very huge and the code is really complex. So the idea was mostly to enable traces at both sides in the GUI and the application servers. And by analyzing network tracings and the application traces, trying to understand how the protocol works and how all the packets are, are composed. So another of the goals was to learn by interacting with the different components and at the time that having some uh, knowledge uh, about the protocol uh, implemented uh, in, in my own tools. So let's see how a uh, regular DIAG packet looks like. Uh, first is the network interface protocol, which is only a four bytes header that e e contains the length of the remaining payload. And the DIA protocol is composed by different headers and the payload itself. Uh, there's one header that is optional and it's only used during the initialization, which is the DP header. Then you have the DIA header, which carries information about the, the communication. The compression header, which is also optional and only present when the payload is compressed. And the payload itself, that is the part that carries all, all the relevant information, all the screens, data, and et cetera. And it's composed by a variable number of different items. So let's start with each one. Uh, initialization is start by the GUI application. It's only composed by the first packet and only travels uh, and compress. And during my test, I only identified two relevant states of the protocol, when the connection is initialized or not initialized. So there's no, no, nothing more on, on this. Uh, the DP header is a 200 byte length header, and it has two different semantics. For an internal perspective, it's used for inter-process communications, between the dispatcher service and all the different work processes. Um, from a network perspective, which is uh, the, the relevant for, for this talk, uh, most of the fields are filled with default values, 
and there are only two relevant fields, uh, a terminal name and a length field, which is the length of the remain of the, of the packet. So let's move on the DIA header. The DIA header is present in all the DIA packets, and it's an 8-byte length uh, header. Uh, there are only two relevant uh, fields. The first one is the mode. Uh, the mode is a one byte field that identifies different sessions using the same communication channel. So you can, for example, have two different subgui clients running different transactions, business transactions or programs in SAP, and these fields identifies each one. The remaining relevant field is the compression flag, which is set uh, to a different value when the compression is enabled or disabled, and when encryption is, use, is being used with SNNC. So about the compression, well, it's enabled by default. Uh, it uses two different variants of the lampet civil compression algorithm. LS77 uh, and LS78, and it's the same implementation of MaxDB open source products. So this code is, is available. And one interesting thing is that can be disabled in the GI application by setting an special environment value. So when the payload is compressed, there's a compression header. Uh, with four fields is uh, also an eight bytes length header. Uh, the first one is the uncompressed length of, of the payload, uh, an identifier of which algorithm is being used, a magic bytes which are, are uh, constants, and a special field which uh, depends on which protocol is, is being used. So the payload itself and which is the most important part of, of every packet, is composed by a variable number of items. During my tests, I identified these 11 different uh, items. Uh, some of them are for care information about the screen, about the, the connection, XML streams, and etc. And we will be focusing on one of these items, which is the APPL or APPL4 items, which carries the most uh, relevant uh, information. So each one of these items has also their own header. Uh, the first field is the type, which denotes if there is an APPL or APPL4 uh, item. Uh, then you have a length field, uh, which also can be two bytes length or four bytes. And then you have two additional identifiers, an ID and SID. Uh, during my test, I identify uh, 172 different combinations of IDs on SIDs. So if you, have, if you look at a DIAC packet, you can find, find uh, several different items and several different APPL items, each one with their own mean and their own format. So the combination is uh, really big, and the complexity of each packet is, is it's also interesting. So there are some highlights or some things that I found interesting. Uh, during my research. The first one is that one of the APPL items that uh, must be included during the initialization uh, is the protocol version. So one of the things that I found is that if you specify uh, a specific version number uh, during the initialization, all the remaining packets coming from the server will be uncompressed. So this is useful, for example, if you are writing uh, an exploit or, or, or some script or, or some code, and you don't want to, to use all the compression functions in, in all your packets. 
Uh, another interesting thing is about the authentication. Uh, what I found is that the authentication is performed as a regular dialogue step. So the authentication is, from the protocol perspective, is the same that uh, every a single transaction that you can run in the GUI application. There are input boxes, you enter information, that information travels to the server, the server uh, parses it and, and handles it, and that's all. So this has an, also a, a, an interesting uh, thing from, from a security perspective, and is that all the packets and all the requests coming from the DIAC from the GUI application using the DIAC protocol uh, are handled using high privileges because the, the program doesn't know uh, which are the, the, the user and it's not already authenticated. So another thing that I found interesting and I think uh, that is, is the most important one is that I found that the DIAC protocol is used only for carrying all the screens and all the context information, but the actual actions on both sides, on the GUI application and on the application server, are performed uh, using RFC codes. So there's one special APPL item that carries RFC codes. RFC is another SAP's uh, proprietary protocol. Uh, it's mostly used for interfaces and for communicate different subsystems or sub with external systems. So this is interesting because uh, the server does not accept RFC calls until you have authenticated, but because of the protocol is unencrypted and there's no strong or mutual authentication, the client uh, do accept RFC calls and, and this can be used uh, in a very interesting way. So let's move on to some results and finding of, of, of my, my research. Uh, first is for packet dissection. I wrote a Warshak plugin. Uh, it's a plugin written in C and C++. And it has four main dissectors. The first one is for the network interface protocol. Uh, and it does all the DCP reassembly basically no, no, not much. Uh, I also include an additional dissector for the router protocol with some basic uh, support. And then there's the DIAC protocol dissector, the, the most important one, uh, which handles all the decompression and identifies the different uh, parts of the DP header, the DIAC header, and the compression header. Uh, it also identifies the different items and some of the most relevant are also uh, dissect. The value of those items are also dissect. And this dissector also calls the RFC dissector when found an embed call. So the last dissector is for the RFC protocol. Uh, it has some basic coverage because it's another protocol and the, they will need a, another research project. But some of the relevant parts of an RFC call are, are also dissect. So here are some screenshots. I will be showing some, some fun with, with the tool later. Um, for packet crafting, um, I built a small library using SCAPI. SCAPI is a Python library to craft packets at a low level. It's a framework that you can use to build your own protocol implementation. Um, you can extend and create uh, new packets using SCAPI classes. So there are four main classes, the SAP network interface class, uh, another class for the DIAC DP header, uh, the main one for the DIAC protocol, uh, which is the one that handles all the compression. Uh, one class for DIAC items. Uh, some 
custom classes are included for the relevant uh, items, but you can also uh, create different classes for for the different items. So the tool also includes an extension for all the compression and decompression, which is based on, on the on the compression functions uh, being public. So I also include some example scripts and proof of concept uh, scripts. For example, to gather information on the application server, to perform a login brute force uh, using the protocol, to run a man in the middle attack, uh, set a proxy between the GUI and application server, or to plant a fake DIAC server. So I will show some of the tools working. So the setup for these demos is very basic. Yeah. Uh, I have a this Linux box with my tools installed and I have a, an application server running in another VM. So I will start the Wireshack and using the sub GUI for Java, uh, make a connection to the application server. Okay, this is uh, the standard sub GUI a desktop application. So I will make a login. And just to look how the packets look like, use the display filter. And this is the initialization packet sent from the GUI to the application server. And you can find the GB header with all the relevant fields, the diag header, and the message, which each item and, and, and their values. So, for example, if you want to find the credentials, you can use the different filters and look, for example, to one of the text contract that has a flag, uh, which is the invisible flag, uh, denotes that there's a, a password. And looking into the packet, you can find, for example, the password in plain text. So, this is useful for for research, for uh, trying to, to, to understand how the protocol works. And I will show also who this looks using the SCAPI classes. So I will make a connection to the application server. And I will grab the login screen and this is how a uh, packet uh, looks in in the using the the capitals. So obviously, uh, each of these items and each of these fields can be manipulated, and you can also craft your own packets using these tools. So uh, let's move on. How I use these uh, tools? Uh, well, one of my goals was to look if there's any vulnerability in either the GUI client or the application server. So I came up with this fusing approach uh, for the test cases generation and for delivery of the packets, I use uh, my own SCAPI classes. Uh, I use WinDBC for monitoring of the target. 
and I use XML or RFC for synchronization between the different components. And the only thing you have to take into account if you are fusing an application server is that you have to monitor all the work process at the same time because you don't know which of the work process are handling your, your request. So using this approach and some manual tests, uh, I found six vulnerabilities on the SAP application server. Uh, these issues were fixed on May by, by SAP. And five of the issues are denial of servers vulnerabilities. Uh, three of them requires that you enable the developer traces on the application server. And there are two more that does not require the, that feature to be enabled. But all can be triggered by an authenticated and a remote uh, attacker. Um, the another vulnerability and the most in interesting one is a uh, remote code execution when the developer traces uh, are enabled. Uh, it's basically a stack buffer overflow while the application server parses one special API item. Uh, so, well, Francisco Falcon from Course Exploit team uh, wrote the, the exploit for, for this issue, so thanks to, to, to him. Uh, I will show. Well, uh, so, all these tools can be used, uh, which I think with, with two different attack scenarios. The first one, and the most obvious one, is to directly target the application servers. Uh, for example, to gather information about the, the servers, to exploit the recently mentioned uh, issues, uh, or to perform a login brute force, or to test for additional vulnerabilities, etc. The Another attack uh, scenario that I think is, is interesting is to target the GUI users. So, for example, you can use all this knowledge and all these tools to perform a kind of client-side attack. Uh, there's a feature in the GI application, uh, which is called GI Sharkat, that are special .sub files that uh, when you open with the GI application, the, the GI starts a business transaction or a program in the application server. So, for example, you can use this to send uh, by email or either uh, embedding in a web page uh, different DOPSAT files or key shortcuts, um, point that shortcuts to your own uh, fake servers, for example, to gather credentials or to inject RFC calls in, in the clients. And another attack scenario uh, is to perform mining in the middle attacks to, to valid uh, GUI users, uh, either by gather credentials or also to inject RFC calls in, in the user's desktop application. So let's see some of these attacks. Uh, first, I will start a netcat here. Sorry. And I will launch an exploit for the vulnerability that I found. So here you have a reverse shell. with SAP service account, which is the account that runs uh, all the database uh, services and all the SAP services. Um, I will show an additional uh, attack vector, uh, which is to set a rogue server and using the standard GUI connect to that rogue server, for example, in this case, I customized some of the 
different uh, components of the screen, for example, showing an additional field and customizing the, the, the help, the menus. Uh, and you can also handle different uh, events uh, start by the, by the GUI. So you can imagine different uh, attack scenarios by planting a, a row server, for example. So there are some defenses or countermeasures that can be applied to tr try to limit the attack surface. Uh, the first one and the most obvious one is to restrict all the network access to the dispatcher service. Uh, the dispatcher service run on ports 3200 and 3299 or 9998. Uh, you can use uh, application level gateways such as the sub router application level gateway to, to perform this uh, kind of segmentation. Uh, another and the most important recommendation is to implement encryption on, on all clients. Uh, the SNNC component provides both authentication and encryption. It's available for free to, I think, all SAP's customers. Uh, Another recommendation is to restrict the use uh, of GUI shortcuts. Uh, you can disable uh, this uh, function on all the sub GUI installations. Uh, another possibility could be to use the web GUI instead of the FAT client. Uh, obviously, patch regularly all your systems to patch especially uh, those affecting the DIAC protocol. There are also additional mitigation and countermeasures uh, recommendations in, in, in course advisory. Uh, and obviously to test regularly all, all your systems. So let's move on to the end. Well, uh, we have discussed how the protocol packets looks like. Uh, the details about the protocol are now available. Uh, practical tools both for dissecting and for crafting packets uh, are available. Both tools will be released with the GBL uh, license, so it will be uh, available for, for anyone. Uh, there are new vectors that uh, are now practical. Uh, there are well no vectors uh, but uh, now it's possible to, to perform actual attacks. Uh, we have also discussed some countermeasures and defenses to try to protect uh, your, your subsystems. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of future work that uh, for around this protocol. Uh, for example, uh, it's it will be interesting to perform a security assessment uh, and fusing of all the components and all the different items. Uh, as I mentioned, every item has their own format and there will be different vulnerabilities at the time that both the GUI or the application parses the, the different items. Uh, also, it will be interesting to, to, to have a complete dissection uh, of the RFC calls that are the most important pa part uh, because of that the actions are performed using uh, RFC calls. Uh, obviously a full implementation of the different attack scenarios and integration with external tools, um, for example, exploitation tools like uh, Metsploit, uh, Core Impact, etc. Uh, also it will be interesting uh, to take a look at how the encryption works and have some coverage for, for the tools for encrypted traffic. There are different uh, settings that you can apply in the application server and there are ones that does not provide uh, integrity, for example, so it will be interesting to, to take a look at the encryption part of, of the protocol. So that's what's mainly all of the 
talk. So thank you all. <laughs>